good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a, just an informal chat. Uh, any questions? Go. We we'll try to answer. We got we got a lot of people. We got the a lot of the regular guys on here that I normally have in my chat. Uh, guest speaker tonight is Jay. I'll let him pronounce his last name because I can't do it. How you pronounce your last name, Jay? Hazelsworth. Okay. Uh, he's a Tennessee B inspector, and he kind of gives us some ideas if anybody got questions on on B inspections. And uh, <clears throat> really, your B inspector is there for your safety. They're there to help you. There's really nothing to be afraid of. Them. They're going to call it like it is and hopefully the main thing they're checking for is American foul brood and you don't have any American foul brood and there won't be any problems but that's one of the worst things we can get um, I'm going uh, to, to, to ask a question I think you got to click on the chat and in that chat I think there's a place to raise your hand I don't have that on my end. Is, is that what is that correct, Langford? Correct. Okay. But raise your hand, and we'll we'll start up. We'll, and this thing is pretty good about that. It keeps them in order, so I don't have to keep track of that. And I'm, first of all, I'm gonna. <clears throat> Langford, if you want to take care of mutant, uh, mutant people, when I go to the screen where I can uh, look at uh, no, maybe I can't. Let me get rid of the chat here. Maybe, I, I am talk, maybe I'm saying it all wrong. Yeah. I'm going to mute everybody and uh, maybe, okay, get that done. I try to, the only ones in question about unmuting yourself is uh, Jay. Can you unmute yourself, Jay? Come yeah. Okay. There we go. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Got that. Cool. Okay, first, I am going to have to go back to the chat because I don't get, I don't get to raise hands. No, that ain't working either. Are you guys seeing any raised hands on, on the side? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. No, he went away. Well, Jay, tell us a little something. We get some questions going here. All what? right. Um, what? What's that? What is your role as a bee inspector? Uh, make sure the uh, hives are healthy before they're moved and educate the public. So, you know, we, we try to stay to the bigger beekeepers and let the local uh, inspectors kind of get the guys with 10 or less hives here in Tennessee. I try to get everybody with 10 or more hives, but sometimes it's just the new beekeeper calling up and saying, Hey, you know, I need, you know, some answers. Uh, so I'll go out there and talk with the new beekeepers, you know, and try to get them through that first or second year is really rough on a lot of them. So, you know, if you're going to the meetings or even YouTube, you know, it's, it's a whole different ball game than to be there in front of your own bees for the first year. So we help out a lot of them, uh, going around the clubs, talking to the clubs, going to, uh, pretty much anywhere they need us. You know, anybody that's got a question about bees. And in Tennessee, you have to be registered. It's free, but you have to be registered. And it's mainly for American Fowl Brood, so we can find you quickly. Um, and anytime you move bees from your property to someone else's property or out of the state or in the state, they have to be inspected. So that's mainly what we're trying trying to do is uh, inspect bees, make sure no nothing comes in the state or nothing goes out of the state that's not healthy. 
And then any of the queen breeders, um, we we inspect to make sure you know they have good stock and they're they're making good bees. If I was to bring bees into Tennessee and I've been inspected in Indiana, do I have to be inspected coming into Tennessee still? No, as long as you bring that uh, inspection sheet and you know, and then you just got to turn it into us or at least send us a copy of it saying, "Hey, I'm bringing them in," and then you're fine. But if you come in without them, then you know, let us know when you're coming into the state so we can be there that day or pretty close to it so you know the bees don't start flying and spreading disease everywhere well that's the way it is on most states where i've been as long as i've got my inspection sheet with me which i carry in the truck all the time that you're yeah. legal to come in the state okay here we yep. got we got the first question here uh, joyce i mean joyce you're up Uh, yeah, I I wanted to know if it was be possible to schedule a time to be inspected. I'm actually in Tennessee. Whereabouts are you in Tennessee? Polk County. Uh, where's Polk County? Okay. <laughs> Give me a major uh, city. <laughs> um, east northeast of Chattanooga. Okay. Yeah. Um, well. Pretty much everything's done for the year because it's too cold. But uh, yeah, if you email me the bmanj at gmail dot com and give me your address and what you're looking to get scheduled, then we can do that. How many hives you got? I'm over one or in twenty five. Oh, nice. Yeah, um, just let me know. Are you looking to move them, or you just want to get an inspection for your own knowledge, or? Um, I'm hoping to start doing some serious grafting and mating nukes next spring. Um, okay. So, um, as the saying goes, Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, I'd like to start selling queens next year. I've got some of bees in my yard and uh, a couple of other lines as well. Okay. Yeah, just send me an email and then when uh, the weather starts getting turned and start turning warm uh we can set something up then the bmanj at gmail.com yep okay thank 12 you 12 letters kindly. the bmanj okay thank next, you very kindly sir the next question we got from uh bruce here let me meet you bruce okay go ahead you there bruce Bruce from Texas. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Jay, um, what's your workload like in Tennessee? I'm, I'm just curious about, uh, you know, how much you get around Tennessee and look at uh, apiaries. Uh, I mainly concentrate on the east side of Tennessee, so anywhere up to, like, Mountain City, Bristol, over to uh, Crossville and Cookville and all the way down <clears> to Chattanooga. <throat> so in the spring, I'm pretty much booked up, and then – uh, summer starts lightening up all, you know, people start moving bees down south. So it starts getting a little heavier again. Then in the, in the winter, it's pretty much, uh, nothing going on. But if American fall brew breaks out, uh, we concentrate mainly on that. And, you know, wherever that one hive is, I, we, uh, take care of that one hive. And then I start checking every frame in every single hive for eight miles in every direction. So that can eat up, you know, a good month's worth of inspections for everybody because I'm going to be concentrating on that first and foremost. This, this is probably a, a dumb question, but have you ever seen any uh, um, Africanized bees in that area? Is that just way far north? Uh, people will bring them into the state, um, but as far as us having it here, no. And my boss, the state apiarist, as soon as he finds them and we you know, we test them and make sure they're Africanized, he, uh, disposes of them okay because we yeah. don't want any of those crates lying around in tennessee is what his thinking is now i'm, I'm down in central texas uh, uh you know we do have pockets of africanized uh colonies around us but uh yep. in in my specific area I, I guess i've been pretty lucky we we have not had any uh africanized bees you know in the 
I, I want to say like the five mile area, uh, a five mile radius. And of course, if, if we were to find them, we just uh, requeen real quick. Yeah, and that's good. I mean, as long as you guys are on top of it, then yeah. keep you doing it. Well, you said you dispose of the, the African eye hive, Jake. Can, will, you, will you let the, the beekeeper requeen immediately, or, not, or that's not an option? Uh, that's not an option with the boss right now. Um, hopefully, basically, he just goes in there and he euthanizes the uh, hive. You know, we close it up, wait for nightfall, spray ether in there, and then uh, start over. Sometimes you, I mean, you can use soapy water, but then you got a bunch of soapy water in your hive and you got to let it air out and, you know, hopefully get all that crap back out of there. Where uh, ether will, it's heavier than air, so it's going to drop. And as soon as you open up the hive, it's all going to come out the bottom board and be gone. Okay. Is this law in the state of Tennessee or is this, is it, this is his procedure? Uh, this is his procedure. And since he's the boss in Tennessee, he gets to do what he wants, I guess. <laughs> okay, just question. But, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I have mean, some he, questions. He tried, oh, yeah. I mean, he tries the best he can with everything, but, I mean, he's done the whole state for 20-some years all by himself. And it wasn't until about five years ago he started getting some help. So. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I mean, he's dealt with Africanized bees a hell of a lot more than I ever have. So, um, I, I actually have never seen Africanized bees, so I want to. Just to see what's going on with them. So, he's not taking his head now. I'll finish with I. You don't want that. Uh, there, I have experienced uh, a couple of uh, bad colonies, and there's a difference between mean bees and an Africanized colony. Uh, oh, a, a very stark sure. difference. Uh, it's just not something that uh, nothing, that got me out of uh, uh, working bees out of houses uh, south uh, in oh. South Texas. Uh, I, I just won't do it anymore. But uh, you know, I don't have a concern if somebody has to uh, uh, get rid of them. Uh, although you know, I, I know people that have tried to uh, requeen. It's it's not very easy to do. Yeah. Okay, Joe. Yeah. I've heard that about Africanized bees. I mean, I don't know for sure, but every time you try to requeen them, they kill the queen. So I don't know. I've never played with them, so I'm not sure. Don't have any experience with it either. Everybody's bashful tonight. This will be got. I got a whole list of questions. Ah. Everybody just want to learn tonight. Nobody. We can't. We can't learn unless we ask questions. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Yes. I know in West Virginia, that's also the case. If Africanized colonies are found, they are destroyed. Um, that's, that's, that's a policy we have here also. I don't know about a lot of the other states. Your state may be that way. A lot of the northern states are like that, I think. Well, and, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm understanding that the actual genes of Africanized bees are showing up all over the United States. They're not, they just got some in, in the bees and, you know, we're getting them from California and, and everywhere else. I, I, you know, I don't know what percentage, there's a different percentage of what, how they are on killer, on Africanized bees. Um, Purdue University has, has a new assistant professor now that they hired out of Canada. His name's Dr. Brian Harper. And He's a geneticist, and he's been doing a lot of those studies in Canada as part of his doctorate degree. And he was telling us a couple of months ago um, that they put out a survey that any bee farmer that wanted to send them bees to the college where he was at, could, and they would do DNA testing on them to determine lineage, that sort of stuff from those bees. And they had bees come in from just right below Alaska, like almost in Alaska. And they were still showing a small percentage of Africanized genetics in those bees. So he, he tends to think it's spread somewhat everywhere. Well, on that point, Jay, do you, do you know if they 
suspect a hive of being Africanized, what percent Africanized they be before they destroy them, or and like I say, you could have you know just a, a small percentage and still not be Africanized by any means. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, threshold is. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, a Africanized bees are actually a better bee, as far as I would think. I mean, everybody I've talked to years ago, when you know, before they even came to America or uh, U.S., they uh, they've been dealing with them down in South Africa. And they said they multiply much better. They make a lot more honey. They, you know, they don't have to deal with rolamites that, you know, other bees do. And it's like, well, they seem like a much hardier bee, but the only problem is working the damn things. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to put on a three-layer bee jacket so they don't have to get ate up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've been in queenless hives. And, I mean, I think the worst one was that I had 147 stings in my pant legs. And, uh. Yeah. You know, I started, that's why I got away from wearing blue jeans. I started wearing uh, slacks because my boss walked up there in slacks and he blew in the hive and, you know, they come out and he took a sample. He didn't get a single sting. Here I am getting, my pant legs are getting chewed up because the bees could grab those blue jeans and not my, not his slacks. So now I wear the khakis all the time. Mm -hmm. so. There's a definitely a lot but of yeah. difference in mean bees and African bees though. Oh, yeah. Africanized yeah. bee, the whole colony a lot of times will dump on you. And that, the, the, you know, that, even the most aggressive hives, they won't do that. You may, you may get a few thousand come out of there, but the whole hive don't dump on you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, here, we got another question here. Vince, you're up. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Well, pretty good. Hey, quick quick question. question. I, I'm you know, like when you treat with Apivar strips compared to fogging, if I treat with my Apivar, you don't see a whole lot of uh, mites, you know, on your sticky board. But when you fog them, you see mites at the bottom. Why is that? I know the Apivar works. You leave it in for the six weeks, and you don't see a whole lot of mites at the bottom. But then when you fog, you got all kinds of mites at the bottom. Well, the Apivar has been used for so long now. According to, to the scientific bee man, uh, he's thinking that the ap apivar is getting they're getting resistant to it. So that may be. To, I mean, you know, if it's working, they ought to have a mite drop. That's what I would think, right? And, and, you know. Well, go ahead, Jay. It's all. It's also uh, more of a slow release type effect. So you're not seeing that sudden drop that you would. And when they are dropping, sometimes the bees take those dead brolamite out of the hive, just like everything else. You know, it's dead. It doesn't need to be in the hive, so they'll, re they'll remove it. But it's more of a slow release, I believe. So, therefore, you're getting a slower mic drop mm -hmm. on the bottom board mm -hmm. versus when you're fogging it. Yeah, it's instantaneous, and they drop quick. Right. What, I never what, thought about the bees cleaning the hive out themselves and taking them out. What, what I would do next year just to make sure that, that, that what I'm saying are not getting resistant to it. Do your Apivar treatment. Or however, what is it? Six weeks? I don't even know what it is now. Six weeks. Six weeks, because I don't use Apivar. But, uh, after six weeks, fog them. If you still, after six weeks, you've got a big mite drop, you're going to say that you've got a resistant mite, and the, the Apivar strip's not working for you. That's the safest way. Or yeah, do, a mite, right, do a mite count, one or the other. Yeah, after I after yeah, I, I mean, pulled the, well, after I pulled the, uh, the then I fogged them. Yeah, and and you had the big yeah, mic drop after you fogged them. Yeah, I had a pretty good mic drop. Not 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 a big one, but I had a mic drop. You can count them. Mm. I mean, it's always best to check your mites, your mite count after you've treated with anything, just to make sure the treatment worked. <clears throat> we don't rely on. I'm going to put this treatment in here and it's going to kill everything or it's going to kill 80% or 90% or whatever it's rated for. Still do a mite check afterwards. Cause you don't know where all them damn mites are. You know, 90% of them might be under cappings. And if you're doing a treatment that doesn't get under the cappings, then it's not going to do you any good. That's right. like a lot of people have been doing that oxalic acid, you know, once a week for six weeks. It's like, well, that's great if you're doing it every Sunday, but what about all the mites that came out on Monday and they're back into capping by Thursday? All the ones that came out on Tuesday and back into capping by Friday. You know, 
you didn't treat any of those or her daughters. And then, you know, next week, you know, they pop out again and you're just in this same cycle of treating on every Sunday and it's not killing. There was a study, I can't remember which uh, university did it. They did it for six weeks with oxalic acid in the middle of summer. And over the six week period, the mic drop, uh, dropped by 5%. That's nothing. And that's a bunch of, to me, that's a bunch of wasted time and a bunch of wasted money. So oxalic acid is made for when they're broodless. So when you catch a swarm, great time to treat them. This time of year when it's getting too cold and there's not much brood in there, that's a perfect time to treat them. Then it works excellent. But in the summer, it's a waste of time, I think. I, I did my bivar in the, uh, oh, God, when did I put it in? I was beginning of September, I want to say, end of August, beginning of September. <laughs> so, and then yeah. I fogged them afterwards. Well, I get, there's a big difference in bees. I, I did, we're going to use it for instance. Me and Jason basically treat the same ways. And uh, my mic count in my yard, and this not this past year, this is a, a couple of years ago, was uh, nothing. And he would treat and within seven days. He's back to the uh, just a, the level he was before he started. I mean, these mites, these mites they can bring them in if they're rot. If you got good strong bees and you got neighbors that's got sick bees or not healthy bees, they'll go rob them out. And they'll bring them mites right back in into the hive. I mean, it can it can happen overnight. It's something you got to stay on top of. Right. You got any comment on that, yeah. uh, Jason? I was just going to say, you know, it's just like you said, I think a lot of a lot of stuff dealing with beekeeping is location dependent. What, what does really well in one place, what particular stock may not do that well in a different place because there's different forage, uh, different people around that are bringing in maybe packages that have no mite or disease res resistance, maybe already diseased. Um, there's there's a lot of different variables that can go on from one place to another. Yeah, and that's a big thing with you know location and I mean if you treated and you killed every single mite in your hive, but the neighbor you know three days later the neighbor's hive is getting robbed out by your bees and they rob out all the honey and they bring out back all that prolomites. Now you did nothing. So it's you know it's. It all depends on time of year. It depends on the foraging that's out there. Um, you know, you can look on YouTube and get some great answers from a guy in Washington state and you're down in Florida. Well, it's not going to really, you know, be the same or in Arizona where there's a lot less vegetation and over here in Tennessee, we got a ton of vegetation. So it's like, you got to be more localized and figure out what's going on right around you. And even sometimes, Tennessee's got seven different microclimates. So, you know, you got seven different areas that all do differently. All right. So it, yeah, you really got to pay attention to your bees and do a mite check and, you know, make sure they got food in there. Right. Yeah. I even, I even bought the pro vamp. I love that thing. It, that is so nice. I was using, I was using a regular fogger. And I got the pro vamp. I love that thing. Just the way it releases. Yeah. Now, I uh, I run a lot of uh, VSH queens, and I think that's a, the better answer. But is it it the cure all end all? No, it is. It's not. There, there's some even in 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 actual strains, some hives will do better than others. I've run it long enough in this yard, and I'm thinking Jason has too. That between that and the cures. This year, I seen when I done mite counts, I seen very, very little mites. No, no sign of uh, the virus, you know, uh, uh, deformed wing virus and that sort of thing. So next year, I'm on, I'm not going to treat. I am going to test, but I'm not going to treat. Oh. And and going to see if these bees is what I say they are. <laughs> that's what I'm. I, what's what I'm shooting for, and I've been here for a long time now trying to make a better bee, so we'll see. I think I've got enough what few that swarmed here and got in the trees and they're surviving. I'm getting enough of the drones around that I'm thinking it, it's really helping. Cause really, the last two years, the mite load in this yard has been 
almost nothing. Jason had a few that he tested this year that wasn't treated all year and had less than a half percent in in <laughs> September. So, you know, that, that's saying a lot. Yeah, I checked those again yesterday. I think it was up around. Oh, no, this I, was, I was talking. And, uh, they're, they're still booming. They're still doing it. Yeah. If, if no one's noticed on the, on the group chat, uh, Jay has posted his YouTube channel there if you guys want to check it out. Yeah, I think you got to click on chat and it'll bring another window up on the right hand side. It does all mine anyway. Yeah, yeah I finally I, figured that out. Yeah, if I do the chat, I can't, I can't uh, see all the participants and mute and unmute. Is the only reason I'm not looking at the chat. So if you're asking a question in chat, <laughs> it won't be answered here, on here unless somebody reads it. Todd's watching them pretty close. Is Todd taking care of it? Yeah. Thank you, Todd. Bruce, Al, somebody bound to have a question. <laughs> Apparently I answered all of them so damn good, nobody's got a question anymore. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, you know, um, and I, I think I saw Dean there in Galveston. He's, I got the same problem he's got. Uh, 70 degrees yesterday. It gets up to 70, gets down to 43, goes back up to 64, goes down to 43 at night. Uh, I mean, we're still in a pretty nice fall weather, and uh, my concern is condensation. Uh, the bees go out every day, and, and – uh, they're bringing back something. They're bringing back pollen from somewhere. I'm not sure where, but what I'm afraid of is I keep going hot, cold, hot, cold, that uh, I might have a problem with condensation in my hives. So uh, uh, the two things I've thought about doing is uh, make some uh, some sugar cakes to put in the top. And uh, and then uh, I saw somebody uh, said take a uh, fold over some burlap and put it in the top of the over the frames. And uh, that might absorb any condensation if it uh, if it, if it's present. Does mm. anybody else have any ideas on that? Mm. Are your hives vented on the top? Yes. I probably wouldn't worry too much about it if they vented good. <clears throat> you start to say something, Jay? Yeah. What I do is um, on my inner cover, I just pop off the outer cover on that inner cover. I pour just a bunch of uh, cane sugar on there. And then I close it back up, and the moisture is going to usually go towards the top of your hive unless bees are fanning it, and then you don't have to worry about it. But if it does go up there, that sugar is dry, so it's going to collect that moisture, and it helps the bees out in the long run. I mean, if they do get up in there, they're going to eat eat on that uh, wetter sugar. Um, that, or you can make a, the uh, wick boxes. Basically, it's a like eh, kind of like a shallow frame or a shallow box and you put your uh what do you call it your wire mesh underneath and then you fill it full of uh, cedar chips that way it helps pull the moisture up you take off your inner cover and you just have that up there and your outer cover on top of it and the cedar chips will bring the moisture up and I, and then it gets trapped in the cedar chips <clears throat> okay I mean, you do, you do want some ventilation in there, but I mean, most of the time in this type of weather, as long as it's a strong hive and it's going over 70 degrees, they're getting that moisture back out of that hive. I would it's, think it's, it's usually. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I would think it's okay. 70, 70 and 46, that different. They would still be making brood if they're a strong hive. Now, if it's a weak hive, they wouldn't be, but a good strong hive should be still making brood, I would think. Oh yeah, I, the, I I've got brood. I, I've also got lots of honey. There, it's as if we're still in a, a, a nice fall weather. I mean, we we just haven't hit the winter yet, which lucky. which which is a good thing. Lucky, lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Vince, you're up. Well, I was going to say about the inner about the um, uh, insulation. What I I'm up here up in northern Illinois. 
And uh, I just like one by fours. I made like a one by four box and I put two inch foam in it, drill the hole, you know, drill the hole in the center of it, and put that on top. And there's no condensation whatsoever. That thing works really nice. You pull that off in the spring and there's not one, you know, you see mold, you know, it's black. That bottom of that plywood, because I, I build the box with a one by, with one by four, put a piece of plywood in it, drill a hole, put the foam in there, two inch foam with a hole. You take that thing off in the spring and it looks like it's brand new. There is not one ounce of mold or anything anywhere in there. That kind of, that moisture just leaves and that insulation keeps it nice and dry in there. It works really well. Yeah. I have uh, two inch insulation in my high top feeders and I typically don't have any moisture problem either. I, yeah. I assume that has something to do with it. Uh, Marlon, you're up. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Oh, pretty good. Hey, um, no, we was just having trouble getting someone to speak up there a while ago, and, and I was just wondering if uh, anyone has seen the the new invention of the laser beam for the kilomites. Oh, you, you drop a frame in there that's made, takes a couple of D batteries, and it detects the, the mites on the B, and it zaps the mite, and it takes about 15 seconds for the mite to, or the B to come back, but the mites, it does kill the mites. It's uh, it's kind of an innovative new technology that's coming out. I don't know if anyone ever heard anything like that or what they think of it. or I've never heard of anything of that, but, I mean, it's, it's reading the back of the bee, right? It's not reading the bottom of the bee, the, the understomach. So if it's reading the back, they're basically in their questing stage. You're looking for a new cell to jump into. The bees are on the underside of the, of the or the mites are on the underside of the bee, still eating on that fat deposit. Now that's where 96% of the bees or the mites are found on the bee. You know, they there's only a short time once they get done feeding, they climb around up onto the top of the back of the of the bee and they're waiting to bump onto another bee and then they jump onto that and then they find another spot in the hive. And so I don't know how effective that would actually be. The, the laser is in the access hole in the corner. And as the bees travel through there and the idea is, is to put this thing in an early spring free of mites. And if they can kill one mite every other day, um, they should be able to stay on top of it. And uh, so they're having the some good success. Yeah. Well, that's what some of the comments were saying was why not put it in the entrance when they're coming in? Um, yeah, I mean, that would help out better because that way it cuts out the mites before they even get in the hive. Because they're I don't think so. at that point, they're riding on the back of the bee when they're coming in the hive, and, you know, they're not feeding on the bee most likely. Most of the time, when they're coming in the hive, they're on the backs of the bees or on the, you know, on their legs or the sides. So that would much work much better at the front of the entrance, I would think. Yeah, it's a university, and I forget where that was at, but they're working on it. And hey, it's a different approach, and I just thought it was kind of interesting. So. Uh, yeah, lo it'd be kind of cool if it worked. Yeah, a lot of the new stuff. I'm kind of just waiting to they prove it because you know, like the one where they heat the brood up. I mean. Does it kill mites? Absolutely, but it also kills bird. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, when you heat something up to 112 degrees and, and the larva can only stand 95, and it's been proven that they kill, it kills the bird. Well, I mean, you know, I can do a brood break and do the same thing and save money and not kill all my bees. <laughs> so, yeah, and, it, and if that thing uh, malfunctions and goes 3% or 3 degrees higher, you sterilize your queen. Yeah. So, uh, I'll, I'll wait. I mean, it may be great. Hey, I'm for anything. I, I hate a mite. Mite is our biggest well, enemy. I mean, for viruses and everything else. We got rid of the mites. The rest of it would be a piece of cake. <laughs> Uh, affordability is another thing I was wondering if, you know, what are they going to end up with as far as price of, of something like this? You know, I'd say it would be pretty much, for the average beekeeper, I'd say it would be pretty pricey, would be my guess, but I don't know. Well, Cornell University is mm -hmm. the one that's doing the research, and I put a link to an article about it in the chat. Okay, thank you, Lincoln. Okay, okay uh, Marlon, you're up. Marlon Yoder. 
or Martin? Uh, you know, it's Mar. I think that was him you just got. Oh, okay. I didn't put his hand down. Okay, uh, Dean, you're up. Hear me? Just barely. How about now? Yeah, a little better. Okay, just move the computer closer. <laughs> this is my first time doing this stuff. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a new beekeeper, been doing it since August. And I got a uh, new from Steve Brackman down here in uh, Galveston County, Texas. And fill it up to about 19 frames. And then I went to a friend's house. He had some bees up in his rafters. So I got did two tear outs from that. Bought them and took them to a different location at my friend's house out in the country. Uh, didn't get the queen. So I went to our weavers and got uh, two queens and put them, well, the tear outs were two different weeks away. So I got two queens. I put them in one of that tear outs. And then I did a split from the high that I got from Steve and put them in that other, in that split. Release the queens um, after a couple days. And then went and checked them after a week. They were there, but they weren't laying. Went back another week, they were gone. So I, I called uh, our weavers and they sent me another queen for my, my split. I put her, put her in there two and a half weeks ago. She got released, it'll be two weeks ago tomorrow. And we're still in the 70s here. I mean, my, my other hive's doing, my mother hive's doing four frames of brood still, constantly. Uh, so she got released two weeks ago. And then we had about three days of down in the 40s and 50s rather than the 50s, 60s, and 70s last week. So I, I checked on them last Sunday. No sign of her land. I checked on her yesterday. Still no sign of land. Uh, so I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> if she's in there, and I, I say, I, I know some of the weaver's reputation down there, but I'm assuming that they're mated queens. I, I would think that... Uh, oh, I hope they were. You know, yeah, this time of year, I mean, queen... Of course, I can't put a queen in this time of year, so it's late in the year. A lot of times they, they will lay so little that you may not even see it in the hive. I mean, it'd just be a, a small patch here, there, and yonder. So uh, the only thing I would watch if they do start laying next spring, uh, if, you, if you keep them, uh, they might be a little mean coming from where they, where they were bought. <laughs> but, uh, weavers down there gives a bad reputation to the buck bass bee because the African, they're fighting Africanized bees where he's at. <laughs> and uh, it gives the, the buck bass a bad name because the buck bass are not, not an aggressive bee at all when they come from the north. Uh, well, as long as, that, long, uh, long as you're feeding them and they got pollen and the weather's warm enough, I would think they would lay a little bit. I mean, somebody might have another opinion than I got. I mean, they got to have the pollen and they got to be fed. They can, have, they can have all the honey they want in the box. This is what a lot of people don't understand. You can have 10 frames of honey in a box, and if they're not bringing anything in, that queen is going to slow way down, maybe even stop. That's winter stores. They don't use that to produce brood. Only in the early spring will they use that to produce brood. I have a question for you. Okay. Have you actually have you actually seen the queens, or are you just assuming that she's still in there? Well, the the the, the first two I got, the first buck bass I got were marked, so I could see them easily. And like I said, the first week I checked on them, they were in there, and but they weren't laid up or anything. And then the week later, I went in there, couldn't find them anywhere. And they were they were had a big old green mark on them, and I couldn't find them. Now the one I just got two weeks ago wasn't marked, and I really didn't look for her yesterday. I just looked to see if I could see anything laid up. But they're I feed them uh, two to one 
sugar water still, entrance feeder, and they're laying up everything with, with sugar water, not leaving anything open for a delay. But well, I just went to Steve Breckman today and got some uh, pollen sub. Even though we still have pollen here, I've got the pollen sub. I'm going to put some uh, pollen feeders out for them tomorrow. And, and actually make some pollen patties and put them on there. I don't have, where I moved into is a new area. Never had bees there, so I don't have a mite or a high bee problem yet. You know, I probably will later, but I've just got new, new hives in a new location. So, so, so what I would do is I would make sure you actually have a queen in there. I would, on the next warm day, go through there and actually make sure you put eyes on her. Because I'm sure everybody in here has killed a queen and not even knew it. Um, a lot of times the queens are bouncing around or running. You know, sometimes you just don't even see them on the backside of a hot frame when you're pulling the frame out. You roll her just enough. It might not kill her. But it damaged her enough that the bees are like, nope, we got to get rid of her. They'll they'll ball her up and take her out. So um, it's possible. I wouldn't say for sure, but it's possible you uh, might have killed that last queen, and that's why you're not getting any laying in there. But um, I mean, it's getting a little late in the year. But I mean, you're down in Texas; it still should be warm enough. You should have some kind of brood in there. And that's if it's a mated queen. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm wondering if it was actually made a queen. You know, I'll, I, I can understand one of them being bad, but three of them, you know, I'm thinking they may have caged them up too long before I got them, or they weren't made it. I just don't know. So, you had some fine right now, so that's a problem. You, know? you had something to add, Jason? I was just wondering since he's requeened, like three times now, two or three times. Is there still emerging and young brood in that colony? When I when I put this last queen in uh, two and a half weeks ago, I took a uh, out of my mother hive, I took out a frame of cat brood with worker bees on it, with nurse bees on it, and put it in that other hive. So I, so I have nurse bees and Cat brood in there for the new queen, because I figured these other the other, other bees were at least a month old. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to get some nurse bees in there with some cat brood, and that's what's hatching out now. You know, they're already all hatched out. Okay. But uh, so that's something that I run into a lot with cat queens, um, the artificially inseminated queens. If if you stick them in there and there's not a lot of nurse bees or emerging brood at the time, sometimes they're really slow about getting started. Whereas if it's a young colony and it's got a lot of nurse bees and young brood emerging, they'll start right off. So that's, that's, that can sometimes play a role too. How are you uh, introducing the queens in there? Are you letting her stay in a cage for a couple of days, or? I leave them in the queen cage. I pull out the cork where the candy is. The first two, I left them in there for two days. They weren't eating all the way through the candy, so I took the screen off and released them down. The last one, I let them eat the candy out. I took the <coughs> candy out, and yeah. I let them eat completely. And like Jason said, if you don't have enough nurse bees in there, you know, to take care of the queen and the brood, then the Sometimes the queen won't even labor it if there's not enough nurse bees, and they just won't do anything. So, yeah, maybe uh, get some more nurse bees in there. I, I know it's kind of late in the year, and you only got one mother hive, but if you've got just a, a one frame in there, it's got a little patch of eggs on it, put them eggs over. If there's not a queen in there, they should try to make a queen cell if it's warm as you're saying it is down there, I would think. I, I was, you know, I was thinking about that before, but. There's no drones. You know, that's the problem. If I, if I make a queen cell, I get a queen. Well, if it's warm as you're yeah. saying it is, there's some drones around there. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't seen any drone cells on, on my mother queens. Yeah, yeah but there's, there's other beekeepers in the area, I'm sure, and they have drones in their hives if it's still in the 70s. Yeah. I'm, I'm and also, just, just think about 
if you keep robbing your good hive and trying to save this other hive, right. eventually you're going to have two bad hives. So I'd be careful with the uh, keep robbing the good hive for the bad one. Yeah, we do. I don't want to do that. And if this queen doesn't take off and if this pollen stuff doesn't work, you know, it may just end up combining the two hives. So back to one again. Just make sure you got the uh, the queen's not in there when you do that because you're going to lose you're going to lose one of the queens anyway, maybe both. Well, if, if, if I can't find the queen, I'll just leave her in there and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on here. Uh, sorry, can't get a definite answer, but there's so many things can do well, that. It could be wrong, so. Mm. And I'm new at it, so I'm just mm. learning. You know. You said you're not making mistakes. You're not learning. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't have any trouble finding queens, and I've had a four-frame mini mating box, and go through that box and lay every frame out. Look in the box, nothing. In fact, two years ago, we the hive inspector. I was showing her one of these queens in there, and because she'd been in there before, shut that box down. We, she looked through it, I looked through it, couldn't find a queen. I'm talking to you, a couple of bees. There ain't no bees in there. Come back two or three hours later and pulled the first frame out. And there she was. Who knows? <laughs> Sometimes they just do that. Yeah, I, I can see them on your videos and other people's videos. You know, you show where the queen is. I can find the queen right away. I can't find them on my own damn eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 Andrew, you're you're up. Hey, Joe, how you doing? How is everyone doing today? Pretty good. Um, my question is, so I'm getting back into beekeeping. I've been off for like 20 years. Um, and watching all of your videos and other videos, I really want to get into making nukes. The problem right now is, besides not having any bees, um, but I got existing inventory. So I got 16 10 frame boxes. And I got to figure out what I want to do with those. I, I want to stick with nukes. I don't want to get full hives. Um, and I noticed on some of your videos, it looks like you cut a full size 10 frame box in half and convert it into a nuke. Yes, sir. Um, did you have any issues with, you know, the frames being too tight in there? With yeah, you got, you got to take and cut a three eight strip okay. and, put, and put on the, the end boards on each end board and I glue that, staple it, and then I put the box together and glue and staple it again. So it's double stapled to there and they work fine. And that was when Man Lake had them on sale. I, I was buying them for $7 and something for 10 frame. It was a no brainer. <laughs> I can't buy the wood to make a nuke for that. So I just cut a bunch of them out. And you can still see in my video where I got a half a handle cut out. <laughs> That's what caught my attention and I, Kind of saw that and it got my my um you know got my uh, thoughts going. Yeah. Now, if you you could also, if you don't want to mess up the ten frame boxes, you can. They make a what they call a uh, a um, I forget a, a router, but it's it's a uh, for doing finite finite fine thing. It's bigger than a Dremel, but it's not as big as a big router, and you could route you a three quarter groove down the center of it and put you a three-quarter divider and make it into two nukes. Mm-hmm. But there's a problem. It's got some advantages and it's got some disadvantages. Right. I mean, uh, but you, I mean, that's a possibility too if you don't want to cut through and, and actually make them into nukes. But nukes are fine. I, I have, I think there's uh, 50 of them out there that way. They work just fine for me. Gotcha. My other thought was converting them into queen castles. <clears throat> Any experience with that or yeah when i first started raising queens i used queen castles in fact there's two of them out there in the yard been sitting about to drop down now uh, they work fairly decent you run into the problem they get two or two frame queen castles four in a 10 frame box and uh they get overcrowded real quick mm-hmm. uh, uh, if you're in if you're in a place where there's a lot of bees and in this yard there's a lot of bees in the summertime, the queen flies out with X amount of bee, her bees, uh, and when they fly out and she comes back in and she flies through all the bees that's around, she'll bring in a lot of times three or four times the amount of bees she started out with. And I have seen a queen come back and all the bees can't get in the box, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they're a little bit harder to manage. A queen castle is. 
but do they work? Yeah, I, I they work for raising queens, and I wouldn't want to be doing it to raise nukes in them, but for raising queens, they will work just fine. And um, last question for the night is, there's a lot of five frame nuke plans that have the bottom board fastened to the nuke permanent. Um, it almost has like a handle where the, the end bars of the frame. And then I saw you actually have the rabbit where the, uh, the frame sit on and then a separate bottom board. <clears throat> What's the benefit over that as to the other? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, what what they call them? Help me, Langford. What's them nukes called? Because it was supposed the, the design of them was to make the most nukes out of a sheet of plywood, mm -hmm. and I forget what they're called now. Uh, yeah, I don't maybe. personally like them. Uh, I like the individual bottom boards when I, that way I can clean the bottom boards off easy when I take them off and that's personal preference on that part. Right. Uh, I'm going right the opposite. I'm going to the fixed bottom boards with some of them having bottom entrances, no landing board whatsoever. Definitely. So, Go ahead, Langford. From what I've seen over the last two years doing it, and with the PVC portal hive over the three years I've been testing them, it dramatically reduces your small hive beetles. Mine are non-existent in those hives. <coughs> in, in, in this day and age, uh, everybody's bottom board, not everybody, but the commercial bottom boards are three quarters of an inch raised up. And where they got that three quarters of an inch from, I'll never know. Langstrom was definitely that, you know, a uh, quarter to uh, three eighths is, is the op optimal size for the B space. And the three quarters, uh, if you'll notice on the three quarters, they'll, they'll build these little mounds of propolis and wax on the bottom board. That's for them to climb up. They can't reach the bottom of the frame. And uh, I think Langford's doing it. Uh, uh, a few other guys in here is using three eighths bottom boards, and they say they keep them three eighths bottom boards just clean as a whistle. And most most store bottom bottom boards are three quarters on one side. If you flip it over, they're three eighths on the other side. The way most of them are made. Mm -hmm. The only disadvantage on three eighths bottom board if you're using the old type. One for oxalic acid, you can't, they won't fit in there. Hope that gives you some ideas. Yeah, even if it does fit in there, I had an issue with uh, wax melting down. It make the bees too happy. <laughs> I was talking away, talking away, my mic was unplugged. That didn't help matters none. Everybody shut up on me. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the help. Mm -hmm. Al, you're up. Yeah, a couple of things. One, that uh, I have started converting all of my bottom boards to the three eighths. And, and like you say, you don't get the little mounds on the bottom of them anymore. They're clean as a whistle. The question I had is in checking my bees uh, a couple of days ago, I found a couple of uh, five frame nukes that uh, have just small clusters in them. And I wanted to see about the possibility, of how, how would you combine those to make a little stronger hive? Because I'm not sure they can survive for the winter uh, with as small as the cluster is. Well, to actually combine them, uh, you're going to have to do away with one of the queens. I mean, some people got some stronger Hives that they do that way, stronger nuke boxes, and they put a double screen wire on there. That way, they're getting the heat from both of them. They keep both the hives separate. But if you're talking small, real small, uh, chances of that happening and surviving is probably not the, not the best scenario. Anybody else got any ideas? Yeah, my question is do no. I, again, would I double stack and put that board on there? Or should I reduce the number of frames in the box? What should I do to try to keep those? Are you going to, going, to get rid, you're going to get rid of one of the queens and combine them? I really want to save both of the queens. One of them is one of Jason's AI queens. I don't want to lose that one. So 
Uh, again, both are nice queens, and I'd, I'd like to preserve them, and they're pretty good on a couple of frames, quite a few bees, but they're only covering a couple of a couple of frames. And I wanted to see what, how would you combine them, or, or what would you do to try to preserve both of those hives? Well, here's a thought, and I'm, I'm doing it with a queen that I kind of like. I degraded her down or desized it down to a two frame mating nuke, double deep. I bring her in the house. Warm days, I take her out on the front porch. I set her in this exact same spot. They do their foraging at night. I plug up the front entrance, bring her back in the house. It's got a one inch hole drilled in the back of it with a screen door wire over it so they can ventilate it for air. And this is the second year I've done this. I had a queen last year that did the same thing. So you just close them up uh, and bring them in the house and open them back up when you take them out? Yeah, and set them back in the exact same spot. You can bring them in. Like my car garage stays at about 50 degrees in the wintertime. It can get down to single digits and it stays around 50. I've got a hive that sits in the window in there. I put a hive in the window in my garage every year. And that's the first one I pull the queen out of to start making queens in the, in the beginning of the year. That's because, a good for, because of the heat that stays in that garage, they brood up a lot faster than the ones out in the yard. That's a good idea. Hey, if uh, we go back to Andrew's uh, idea or question on his boxes, on a 10 frame, what I what I've done to several is I just take a circular saw and put a groove in there, and then pick it, take a piece of glue on and stick it in there as a divider. Then I have a, the bottom board, I have an opening on one side and one on the other side. That way, it's just a quick uh, nuke. On, and you get, I mean, you can make a two frame nuke out of it, or I mean, a two, two nuke out of it, or you can make more slices in there and make three or four nukes out of it. All right. Going off what you just said, you can use that one inch or two inch blue board you can, insulation you buy at Lowe's. Yep. And just cut yeah, I've done that too. Hive and slide it over. Say you've only got three high, uh, three frames that they're on. You can take all the other frames out, put that in there and slide it over. And that gives them at least a one good side that's going to be quite insulated. That works for building a nuke up to a bigger box. You know, like that, I think he was asking the question because he's going to get into the bees. I think he was wanting more permanent boxes. Uh, and, but like I say, the, 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 the saw, you still give you two permanent five frame boxes. <laughs> uh, Langford, go ahead. I, I was referring to the gentleman that was talking about trying to save his hive. Oh, Al? Yeah. yeah. Putting yeah. the blue board in there and sliding it over to however many frames they're covering. Okay. Yeah, you can you can you can size them down. That's true. If they're only covering two frames of bees, you get the insulation to one side. That that I've done that before. Bring them in the house will work. I've done I've bought them in the garage before on certain things that I didn't want to lose and they wasn't up to snuff because I've split and split and split and got too late in the fall and they didn't build up. We're all guilty of that, I think. <clears throat> uh, Dean, you're up. Yes, sir. Uh, get back to your the new thing. I was watching you, some of your last videos, and you were doing your two frame uh, mating boxes where you know, three or four or two frames in a box. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've been toying with the 3D printer, and I got to download a, a good program for that. I've been designing a bunch of things. But my question is, your two-frame pot feeder that you mm -hmm. yourself, uh, how do you get what do you do? How do the bees go up there and go down in the water without going in there? Do you build a ladder system for it or, or what? Or is it, could you take a picture of that and put it on your Facebook page or something? Okay. Are you familiar with the rapid feeder? No. 
uh, look up the rapid feeder on the internet. The inside of my feeders look di- uh, almost identical to the rapid feeder. They come up in a column, and there's a cone sets down over it, and they can crawl up out of the cone onto the side of the the, the dome and crawl down and feed and come back out. Okay, I'll look that up. Thank you. Yeah, the rapid feeders. Roger, you're up. Roger. Oh, hear me all right? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, I won one of your queens there this summer, and I just wanted you to know she done really good, and I hope I can get her through the winter and maybe raise some more queens out of her this uh, next spring. What kind of queen uh, was she? Huh? What kind of queen was she? Uh, she was a dark-colored queen. I don't know what she was for sure yeah but she she done right right well she's in a two double deep five frame nuke and i appreciate what you do and and we listen watch all your posts on the youtube so we want to thank you joe i appreciate it we try to help. My, there's nobody knows it all about bees, and a lot of those things is the way I. That's the way I do it. There's there's more, there's hundreds of ways to raise bees, and I just do what works for me. And some some things is pretty universal between the bees, but not everything. Uh, Joyce from Tennessee. Um. Yeah, I've got a question i was using um jzbz cups this year and um enjoyed working with them i've got a different incubator that i'm gonna try for next spring and it's basically like a five frame nuke with a thermostat and a heating pad in the bottom of it what i'm trying to figure out is is there any way of working with like a hair roller type page that will fit over the JZBZ? Is that something that will only work with the, um, the NICOT system? Does anybody have any opinions or ideas on? Yeah, JZBZ should fit straight in the top of the hair roller cage. It will? Yep. I do it all the time in the incubator. Yep. Just place it in there and there should be that little rim. Should block the queen from getting out. Mm. Okay, you with the push base cups or or the, the solid cup? The solid cup, we'll just go and get your example. We'll show you in a minute or two. Oh, okay. That'd be cool. Yeah, they're just grabbing one out of the incubator now, so this is Chris. More, he's from Australia. Hi, Chris. So he he's real warm right now. He's coming into spring, early summer. <laughs> he's got all kinds of heat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're sort of the middle of our season, or first third of our season, I should say. Yeah. If you're grafting, and while he's getting that ready, while he's grafting, uh, I think you'd be a lot better off if you if you take the queen cells out before they hatch and put them in in the boxes. And the grafting, you should be able to have it timed pretty well where you don't have any hatch out early, really, because you usually move them two days before they're going to hatch. There you go, and the, we just place them in there. And then when the virgin hatches, you pull them out and you'll get rid of that wax because they can get stuck in there going back to the last of the royal jelly. So, yeah, they just sit straight in like that. Oh, cool. Mm. I did not know. So hopefully that helps out. Mm. Yeah, because um, I was <clears throat> watching something that the Joe was doing with the 2 by 4 and I was thinking if there's a way of doing that, push come to shove, I could put one of those 
um, U.S. Postal Service rubber bands around uh, the the cup like you just showed me and the mm -hmm. cage and that would hold it tight and I was watching a guy in the UK and on the flip side of the roller cage he just put a drop of honey on the little side on the bottom on one side and a drop of yep. water on the other because I work yep. a full-time job and sometimes um, you know if I didn't always have a place to put a queen last spring so if she was in the the incubator and I couldn't get to her right away I needed to have a a way to keep her safe and I I used the tackle box set up this past spring and it worked okay for me but if I had a queen that hatched and I had two or three or four of them I had a real hard time getting them out of the tackle box without um, <laughs> having two queens in my hand or yeah, I, uh, I understand that or watching another one and making sure she didn't get squished when I tried to close the lid. But the two before work really good. I use this here, which is it's 3D printed, but it's got a little uh -huh. cup, cup in the bottom. Let me see here. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I use a rubber band too to lock them in once they're in there. Yeah, well, because the queens will push them up <laughs> and, and get out. But that's how I raise, raise all my queens. The two, the two before works just fine also. Works just fine. That might be a bit of a question for Jay too, because um, introducing virgins is a whole different kettle of fish to a queen cell. Yeah. The odds to shoot down. Yeah. There's no I do that because they might, with the heat here, they might hatch a day early. So we know that they're not going to get to the rest. But we, my preference is always a cell. Yeah. Mm. Well, in a cell, you take you take uh, one thing out of the chain. If you hatch a virgin, then she they've got to accept a virgin before she's got a chance to get made. And if you put a cell in, it's ninety nine point five percent they ain't gonna kill her. Yeah, I mean, it has yeah. they they hatched in that hive. They will not. I've never had any trouble. Now she may not come back mated, but you take that element out of there, so your percentage is higher about getting the queen back. So you like putting a queen cell into a mating nuke instead of having a virgin hatch? I do. That's it. Yeah. That answers that. Thank you. Yeah, you definitely have a better success rate with uh, the queen cells versus a virgin or even a mated queen. Now I, oh, I, I have on emergency. Sorry, and I had I have on emergency where you know my queen got squished when I pulled a frame or something and I was in a hurry and the queen was dropped right in there and I went over and I pulled out a virgin queen and threw it right in there about, I think it was about two hours later and they accepted her because they knew the other queen was dead. But if you're trying to put a queen into a hive that's been queenless, yeah, they're, they're going to kill it most likely. But that's only been once in a while it works. So don't plan on it. <laughs> yeah. I had much. 10 recently, and I sprayed the frames with sugar syrup and vanilla, and I think nine got killed and one survived. Yeah. Okay, that answer your question? Very much so. Thank you very kindly. You just saved me a lot of trouble, I think. Okay. Uh, Andrew, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I got my boxes. They're all made. I got whatever, queen castles or whatever I do with them. I want to get into making queens, but I don't I, – I'm not going to dive into um, grafting just yet. What, what's the best – or what are some of the best ways for newbies to kind of get into making queens? I, I've seen a lot of people say, like, crowd the box and cut out swarm cells, um, do a, like a walk away, then cut individual cells out those strips of eggs what in your experience which which is the uh i guess the best way to do it somebody else want to talk for a minute somebody <laughs> take that out <laughs> well it depends on how you want you know what your approach is if you're more natural or you want to graft or if you can graft if you can't graft you can notch um 
there's a lot of different ways to do it. It's whatever you want to, that you're uh, comfortable with. I mean, for years, I just I wait until the uh, queen starts getting ready to swarm. They've made a ton of queen cells in there, and I take the queen out, and then I leave a few queen cells in there, and I start dividing all my uh, queen cells into more nukes. Um, I got into grafting, and in my area, grafting sucks because I might get 80% grafts work, but when they go out to mate, I get a 30% return out of those huts hundred you know queens so the birds pick them off the uh dragonflies pick them off the horse flies pick them off they just never make it back so i've kind of quit grafting so many queens because they're just they're getting picked off all the time um i do to like the natural selection so therefore i leave three to four queen cells in each nuke and let them figure it out so, I mean, and the queen cells, you never know the age of them. And if a good a good queen and a good hive, they'll have queen cells in there of varying ages. And, you know, you get the one queen come out, you always hear she comes out and she kills all the, all the other queens. Now, she kills the queens that are usually about 10 to 12 hours within her age. And... That way, when she goes out and she mates, if she doesn't return, they have a backup plan with those other queens. Um, but it all depends on that hive. Some of the queens, yeah, they'll go in, they'll kill every single queen, and then they go out and they mate, and they never make it back. So, But if you want to get into queen breeding, find a breeder in your area or travel. Or Kent, Kent Williams is a good guy. I'm sure there's a bunch of good guys in here. Uh, Lankford, I know him. He He's a good queen breeder. You know, go over to their place, learn what they're doing, and watch them. Because uh, watching it off YouTube, you know, you get the basics, but it's still grafting. If you get into grafting, you got to watch somebody kind of pull that egg out of there and flick it off. Because otherwise, you'll dry the eggs out, and you won't get nothing. So, you know. Me, That's me, my opinion. Yeah, me personally, I don't like crowding a hive down because crowding a hive is funny. Uh, I have seen them raise queen cells, and they'll have the queen hatch, and the queen will fly out and get mated before they the, the old queen leaves. And I have seen them as soon as the, uh, they'll run the old queen out before they're ever capped. I mean, it just varies. There's no no rhyme or reason. It depends on my hive. If I was just wanting a few queens, uh, I would just make a hive, make a split, make a hive queenless, and make, leave it pretty strong. And if if it's a good strong five frame that you leave with it queenless, and they ought to make you 20, 20, 25 cells each time, and you cut them out and cut cells off. The only thing about cut cells, you need to go back in three days later, and if they've got any cells capped in three days, knock them cells out. Because what happens when, when they go queenless, it's it's called emergency cell for a reason. It's an emergency, and they go in there immediately make uh, cells out of three-day-old larvae or whatever, and they'll cap them first. And then they'll go back and make uh, queen cells out of the right age. And Typically, the ones they made out of the three-day-old larva is not real good queens on on that part. But they, they make fine queens. If, if yeah, what you say, yeah, If you want, uh, if you want good queens, then make sure you got good drones, plenty of drones in the air, not from just your hive, but from your neighbor's hives or set up a out yard. Get a lot of damn drones in the air. I mean, that's what makes a good queen is proper mating. And yeah, the the uh, overstocking of that hive and crowding them, and yeah, they can get really stupid. I've seen them chase the queen right out, and then they fly out, and you know, there's hardly anything even capped. You know, so yeah, it's crowding of. A, I mean, I did that in the very beginning, and I got away from it because it was just like you, like Joe was saying, it's just too finicky. You don't know what they're gonna do. <laughs> You know, and they get honey bound at any point because they're still bringing in all kinds of stuff and you're trying to crowd them to make more queen cells and they'll take off on you real quick. Now you lost your good breeding queen 
And now you're stuck with, you know, a bunch of emergency cells. And those emergency, those emergency queens usually don't do too good. So. I have one thing to, to add to that, if it's okay, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. Something else you might want to look up, Andrew, if you're not wanting to do, like, walkaways and notching and you're not wanting to get into grafting yet, you might want to look up cell punching. Um, it involves using a little ringed tool, that tool, and it slips right across. Um, there you go. Joe's holding one up. Yeah, right there. That heated cell punch tool goes right over the cell, larva and all, and you're pulling out a wax plug of the cell with that larva in it sticking on your, your grafting uh, frame. That, that works. I know a lot of people that do that. You're not wanting to make a ton of queens, but you're wanting to make more than you could naturally do by crowding the hive or whatever. That works pretty well, and it's a lot easier than grafting. Um, another thing is, is and, and Jay hit on this real good, drones. If you're going to raise uh, a lot of queens, you want to have a lot of drones and good drones in your area. Flood the area with drones. And something that I'll do is anyone within miles of me that has bees uh, that I know about, I offer them free queens of my stock. And that way I have a control over what drones are within five miles of my area. And I know what my queens are mating to. I also set up drone colonies uh, on other people's property in about a mile circle around my mating. Sounds good. Yeah, that's a well, there's drones. Jason, there. that's a good idea. I mean, if you if you supply queens to all the local beekeepers around you, you can kind of control the uh, breeding stock in your area. I mean, you don't have to have a bunch of out yards. I mean, you start to have that. Now you're driving all over, but if you're just giving free queens away or charge them very little so they buy your queens, then that's a good idea. That way you can control the uh, area. Because you never know who that queen's going to mate up with. Right. And, and Unless I, you're doing artificial insemination when that's expensive. So that, uh, that That's worked really well for me um, on the open mated queens. You know, I do the artificial insemination too to try to keep my pure lines and do my VH, VSH selection and mite chewing and low virus counts and all that stuff. A lot of selection, a lot of paperwork. Um, but this year, I had a lot of reports from people with my open mated queens that were still having like super low mite counts and low virus counts. And that tells me that that stock's getting out. This having them around me, the drones of that same stock and the, the PSH and all that is, is working. I'm hey, Jason, I'm, oops, sorry. Go, go ahead, Jason. Jason, while I'm thinking of it, while I'm thinking of it, Jason, if you're talking at the honey convention, uh, can you do a talk on artificial insemination? Sure. Oh, we can do okay. that. I'll, I'll yep. get together a list of stuff and you just tell me what you want me to talk on. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, honey convention is going to be in Knoxville, Tennessee this year, March 20, 21st. If anybody's interested in that, you can go to honeyconvention.com. Mm -hmm. And um, I agree with Jason. I've got three or four beekeepers around here close to me within a half mile. It's got my bees. And, uh, and it's, like, like I said, I'm going to try to not treat this year just because I, I'm not seeing any mites. So I'm thinking the program's working pretty good. Got one more question here. It's getting kind of late. Um, kind of start winding things down here. Joyce, you're up. You there, Joyce? Yep. I just missed with the click there for a second. I got two questions for um, for Jay. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you were getting very few queens back mated. I think it was like, you know, 10 to 20, 30 percent because of all the uh, dragonflies and, and whatever. Is that something that's typical of this part of Tennessee? or um, it, It's typical of my area. Um, there's 
There's a lot of birds in our area. Uh, the only time they disappear is when the uh, bald eagle comes in or the red-tailed hawk hanging around. Otherwise, I got so many birds, it's ridiculous. Um, you go 15 miles over uh, a couple different mountains, and you know they get 90% of their return rate. So it just depends on the area, and that's that's the same thing with varroa mites and small hive beetles. I've seen pockets really bad in other areas, not even touched by it. So, what was your second question? My second question was, um, I tried this year to get away from what I call puppy farm bees, so I've been very selective in the, where I got my queens, and um, uh, most of the uh, well, a good percentage of the queens in my in my yard came from Joe's um, stock, but um, I only saw one bee this entire season, and it was late July that had crinkled wing. Otherwise, I didn't see any symptoms at all. What did what do you see typically when you go through a bee yard? Do you see a lot of, of crinkled wing bees or does it vary quite a bit? Uh, it always depends on, you know, the different bee yards. Usually in the spring, I see a lot of European fall brood and that's because people are trying to build their bees up so quick in the spring, but not really feeding them enough. And the larvas down there eating all the bottom of the cells, trying to get whatever nutrition it can. It's picking up all that bacteria from the European fall brood. So, there's been, uh, for the last few years, really bad areas about that. Um, you know, then you get a little bit of chalk brood. That's not too often. Uh, some bald brood, not too often, but it's still out there. Um, Rolla mites is one of the biggest things that's bringing in all the crap. And uh, Joe said that earlier, you know, that's our biggest problem is Rolla mites. So, you know, what are, and I'm always, I don't really, well, I've never had to treat. I'm not against treating, but I've never had to treat. And it's, you know, keep an eye on your mite control. If you got mites, treat them. If you don't have mites, why stress the hive and why spend money? You guys will figure out real quick. I'm, I'm really cheap. I try to do everything as least expensive as possible. Um, so if I don't have to treat, I'm not going to put money on it, and I'm not going to put chemicals in the hive that's going to stress out the hive. But if there's mites in there, I'm going to treat. Now, that kind of bit me in the butt. Uh, last year, I lost 34 hives to tracheal mites. So, um, I was going to treat this year, and then, you know, because I just got too busy, I forgot all about it. So, I'm going to probably lose some more hives this winter. But a lot of tracheal mites came back to Tennessee. Because so, a lot of people were treating with nothing but oxalic acid and nothing else. So, that doesn't do anything for tracheal mites. Yeah. How often do you test for mite counts? Uh, I do it in the spring when they're building up and then in the fall when they're building up. I mean, that's when the mites are going to build up is when they're building up. You know, we got that nice dearth in Tennessee, which we did, our dearth this year was late, but um, they're really not doing much in the dearth. And I, I run most of the uh, Russian mutts, so they do much better with the roll mites for some reason. And um, plus they have a, when it starts, there's no nectar coming in, they stop, they shut off. There's no more uh, raising a brood. So you get some uh, Italians though, they're constantly having brood throughout the whole summer, even if there's a dearth and you never really get that natural brood break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have any Italians per se in my yard anymore. Um, I got some carnolians and buckfast from Joe. I've got um, a local bee from a beekeeper that I guess been around for about 80 years. She, the guy that she got them from. And then I've got some Russians in my yard that I got from a beekeeper down outside of Atlanta. And by now, if you if you got all those queens two years ago, they're all pretty much mutts in your yard now, you know, because they probably requeened at some point, and they've all been breeding, crossbreeding like crazy. So, but I do like a mutt bee better than a pure stock. Um, it just they seem to do a little bit better for me. 
Thank you very kindly. I appreciate your time, man. Um, I've had a lot of questions over the summer when we were going to get uh, some of the Robin screen and stuff uh, produced. And the guy that's taking care of that's on here tonight. I'm going to let him talk for a minute here and, and let him just explain what's going on. Uh, let me see here if I can find you, Luther. Uh, unmute or you can unmute yourself. Let me see. There you go. Unmute. Yeah, you're unmuted, Luther. All right, Joe. We're... I'm a construction worker and uh, I've been involved in the construction business, but I tell you the, uh, the um, manufacturing and uh, the wholesale type businesses is really different for me. And also the other people that involve with us, it's not very, uh, no experience in that either. So we've been kind of slow, but we're all making progress. We've got some products made, but we just don't have the uh, website up quite yet, or the actually we don't even have the, price and uh, figured out quite yet so we're we're working on it and we're we're certainly thinking that uh by the first of the year we'll be ready to uh go live and uh we're really excited about it joe uh, i tell you those robin screens i use them myself and, and they're all awesome and and i really like the little vents too they're very convenient and uh uh it's it's all a really nice package. Plus we're working on a couple other products that somewhere along the way, Joe, I want to talk to you about that, about those products we're, we're uh, developing because uh, I'd like to get your input before we actually, you know, put them out. No problem. Yeah. I send you a couple of them to try out and maybe even Jason and uh, Bryant also uh, get you guys. And, and actually, uh, I was thinking about even waiting till after the first year to send those out. I don't know how you got it, the things you can't use right now anyway. It's so cold, and you know the bees aren't flying. It's something you just have to look at and evaluate, I guess. But everything that we we are trying, I've tried them myself, and they work great. But hey, I'm just one person, and uh, I'd certainly like some more input there. Yeah. Okay. Joe, let me ask you one more question, if you don't mind, while we're here. I was going to uh, raise my hand, but everybody was uh, keeping things busy. But what's the lowest outside temperature do you feel comfortable open feeding? I don't like to open feed too much after it gets in below freezing at night. How about uh, daytime temperature? I don't think it matters if it don't get below freezing at night and, it, and they're flying in the daytime. Now, I won't put it on the high top feeders, but open feed. Right. Yeah, that's what I mean, open feed. Yeah. Uh, I don't put any 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 moisture on top of the hive. The only time I open, or on top of the hive anyways, in, in the early spring, the rest of the year, I open feed. Now, I know a lot of people got pros and cons about open feeding, but that everybody's got to do their own thing, make their own decision on open feeding. Right, yeah. All righty. I appreciate it, Luther. Yeah, hey, uh, thank you for the chat, too, Joe. It was some good information put out there. Mm -hmm. Last call. Anybody got any other? One more question. Okay, Jay, I appreciate you coming on and uh, spending a little time with us. I know you need to get on the road and get home. <laughs> it's been a long day for you, all the rest of the guys. I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for coming. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It was fun talking with y'all. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Mm -hmm. You too, Al. Same to you, Al.